Now, I don't know if you've ever written a book, but if you want to write a book, it's really, really important that you plan everything. If you don't plan, it's, it's strange. You start writing and it actually starts to take a life of its own. It goes way over here when you really want to go over there. You've got to really plan everything very carefully. And sometimes, you, you, if you read books, story books and things like that, you see things that it's like almost it just happens. You know, at the end of it, say you read Agatha Christie. Do you know who Agatha Christie is? If you read something like that, at the end everything ties together. But along the way there's all these little hints. And it seems when you're reading it that they just seem to pop up. But if you're writing it, you've got to really, really plan everything very carefully. And Shall I put that clue in there or would it be better to put it in there? It takes a long time, you've got to be very careful and you've got to know exactly where you're going. And <clears throat> this book, the book of Esther, it, it, it shows design. It's, this is a true story, I believe. Some people will tell you that it isn't. But if it wasn't a true story, why put it in there? This is real history that happened in that period that Alan was talking about before, the people coming back. They went away into exile, and it's interesting that there were about 5 million people who were taken away to exile. And I'm doing it the wrong way, but it's the right way for me. And then there were about 50,000 who came back. So there were a lot that still stayed. And they came during the time of Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar was king, and then Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his grandson and his great-grandson, well his son came in there as well, so they had their time and then these Persians came in and the Persians defeated them, the Medes and the Persians, and the new Persian king sent them back. And actually there's evidence of God's plan in there as well, because when they, just as they were ready to go away, the Lord said to Jeremiah, he said, tell the people that they're going to be away for 70 years. And exactly when the 70 years were up, the king said, go back. And so they went back. But there's actually two periods of 70 years. The first period of 70 years is from when the walls were destroyed until the command to rebuild the walls came. And the second period was from when the temple was destroyed until the temple was rebuilt. So it, it just shows God's planning. And some people say it was written after all these things happened because they don't believe in God. But I believe when you read something like this, it gives you just a real insight into the way that God works. God knows exactly what He's doing and God has a perfect plan. And in the middle of it, you might be wondering what's happening. But by the time you get to the end of the story, you see how God has just made sure that everything comes together at exactly the right time. And this book of Esther is one of those tremendous little books and it was designed to be read in one hit. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you sit down and read it in one hit, but it was designed to be read at a festival, a Jewish festival called the Feast of Purim. And when you get towards the end, you'll find out more about that and I won't spoil that. If that's something to look forward to. But it was designed to be read at this particular Jewish festival, which celebrated what this book talks about. And so we start off, and it seems a bit strange. What's all these things happening? What's going on here? But when you finally get into it, and it all works out. You see how there's a little event here that happens, and you say, look, What's that got to do with anything? But later on you'll see that that event is really, really important. And to my way of thinking, this book just gives us evidence that God is actually completely in control of everything. And God knows exactly what he's doing. <clears throat> There's another thing about this book. And some people argue and say, well, the book of Esther shouldn't actually be in the Bible. And the reason they say this is because it doesn't ever mention God's name. So how, why can we have a book, why should this book be in the Bible if it doesn't ever mention God's name? But as I was saying before, it's not a book that mentions God's name, but 
in every section you can see how God is working. So that God is very definitely in this book. All the way through, God is moving things here and moving things there. And in the end, everything works out for the good of God's people and for the glory of God. So it's a book that is full of the fragrance of God. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to an experience like this, but we used to live up in the, in the bush for a while, and there was one season of the year when you would go down into a river bank, you know those paper bark trees? If in the particular season of the year, they would be in flower. And the smell of the flowers was just so heavy. It was almost choking. It was like a really strong honey sort of a smell. And books like this, as you read through them, there's this heavy fragrance of God. And God working through all of the circumstances in the book. And that's why this book is here in the Bible, because it might mention God's name. And often we go through our lives and we, we see these things happening. And nowadays, some people talk about serendipity. Have you ever heard that, serendipity? Serendipity is the chance of coming into good things by accident. That's sort of a definition. Well, things never happen in our Christian lives by accident. They always happen under God's control. So this is a book where we can say it's serendipity, but the real meaning of serendipity for the Christian is God working for our good in everything. And in the middle it might seem bad, but when you look back over it, you say, yes, I can see that God was working. And God was doing things, and God was good to me in my life. So that's what this sort of book's all about. And it, it's a book that definitely should be here in the Bible, because it's a book that shows God working. God working in circumstances where everything should go wrong, but in the end, nothing goes wrong. And another thing about this book is, as we read through it, it's the sort of book that was probably written close to the time when these things happened. Now, that's another theory. People say, well, it was written 400 years later, blah, blah, blah. But that's rubbish as well. Because if you read through some of these Old Testament books and some of the New Testament books, there's all these little pictures that come in about things that happened. And if you hadn't been living at the time, you wouldn't know. Some things happen, we understand things that go on in our lives. You know, in, in, in certain, certain cultures they have things that are good and in other cultures they have same things are bad. But they're never written down. You know, in some parts of the world it, it's good, for example, to chew with your mouth open and make a big noise because that shows that you're enjoying the food. And when, when I was growing up, I would get whack, whack, whack if I did that, you know, because you know, no one wants to look in your mouth. So it's those sorts of things are never written down anywhere, anywhere, but people just know them. And if they're put in the Bible, you have to understand that they must have been written about at the time. Because otherwise, why would people know? You can't look up a book two or three hundred years later and find those little bits of local colour. And this book has a really wonderful picture of life in the Persian king's court and what happens there. <clears throat> and so it starts off with this King Xerxes, and in some versions he's called another name. But this is another issue. How come we, we look in the Bible and they have one name, and then you might look in Persian inscriptions as another name? And there is. It's, this name, Xerxes, is a Greek name. That's the way the Greeks write it. And the Persians, I can't even tell you what it is, but it's different again. Why, why has this happened? Why? Surely God would know what the right names were. Well, you know, at the time, and it happens today, if you come from one language group, there's some words in another language group you just can't say. When I was growing up in South India, my name, Douglas, that's what my mother always calls that because I was always in trouble, you know. If they use your full name, then you're in trouble, Douglas, Douglas. Well, the people in Kerala, the Malayalis, they couldn't make that word in their mouths. It, they just weren't used to that combination of sounds, and so they used to call me Chuck Lease. <coughs> and so it's just, this is a story of, when you speak one language, you act, your mouth works in a certain way, and there's some sounds you can't make. So that they, 
listening to it in that language and then they're writing it down in their own language. So that's why the names look different. But this King Xerxes was actually quite an important king in history because he tried to invade Greece, Greece and Macedonia. And if you study history, he was involved in a really significant portion of history where um, there was a battle of a place called Thermopylae. And that's probably pronounced with an Australian accent, you know, all bad and everything. But this, at this battle, the Persians wanted to come through what is now Turkey and they wanted to beat up the Greeks. And the Greeks had a particular pass where they couldn't go through. But someone betrayed them and showed them a way around the back. That's the Battle of Thermopylae. And this King Xerxes was involved in that battle. They went over and he actually did a lot of damage to Greece, but then he took some bad advice and his ships were beaten and eventually had to come back. And that, that's happening around the same time as these first two chapters. And we know from other sources that this King Xerxes, before he went to the battle, he had a 180 day festival. And the whole idea of that was to impress all his people with his authority and with his wisdom so that they would give him lots and lots of money and then you can go and fight this battle. Because you can't fight a battle unless you have lots and lots of money to support you. So this thing here, it talks about Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces. He ruled Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Iran, Syria, all the way through to India. That was his what? I should be doing it that way for you, shouldn't I? Anyway, it doesn't matter. He ruled that section, but he never got across where Gallipoli is, the Dardanelles, there's a place called there called the Hellespont. He never got across there. And after that was where the Greeks were. And he, he desperately wanted to beat the Greeks. So he had this huge party, and the whole idea was for this King Xerxes to impress everybody with what a great king he was. Here I am, the best king in the world, you can trust me to defeat the Greeks. Give me all your money. That was the whole idea of what was going on. And so, as he's in this, and showing up for everybody and expecting them to give all their gifts to him so that he could fight this war, one of the things he decided he was going to do was show off how good he was by calling his wife. And for him to come and say, here's my wife, that was an extra thing. See how good I am, because his wife was an extremely beautiful woman. And so, imagine how annoyed he was. This queen, Vashti, she was meant to come, but she said, no, I'm not coming. It's exactly the opposite of what he really wanted to happen. Like, this is going to make him embarrassed. She's shaming him, isn't she? And she says, no, I'm not coming. And how many of his supporters said, okay, we're going now. You can't even control your wife. How can you beat the Greeks? So it's, <laughs> it's a bad, bad situation for him, isn't it? But <clears throat> not only was it a bad situation for him, because you see, all his guys, like all his generals and his ministers and all his officials, they were looking and saying, man, this is bad for us too. If the Queen gets away with this, it's going to happen in every single home. Next time I go home and say to my wife, where's tea? She'll say, well, the Queen said to the King, I don't have to make your tea anymore. So this is what chapter 1 is all about. How the women were shaming the men. Right from the very top of the Kingdom of Persia. And so when they got together, they, were thinking, they weren't so, the, all the experts and the generals and the Ministers weren't so much worried about the king and the queen. They were worried about the example. And they were worried about what happens in their own circumstances. And you know, between chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's a little bit of a break. Because one of them talks about the third year of King Xerxes, and then it goes to the seventh year of King Xerxes, further down in chapter 2. Now, that break was just enough time for him to go over 
minute Thermopylae and then get beaten in this big sea battle and come back. And by the time he comes back, he's been embarrassed by having a loss in the war as well. And he wants to get on with his life, and I suppose he's, he wants to have some comfort and support in his home. But the Persians had laws. In King Nebuchadnezzar's day, he could change his mind if he wanted. He could say today, do this, and then tomorrow, no, don't do this. I've changed my mind, we're doing exactly the opposite thing. Whereas with the Persians, if the Persian king set, made an edict or made a law, it had to stay. And that's the story of, of what happened with, with Daniel in the lion's den, you see. They tricked the king into making a law, and then afterwards the king regretted that he made the law, but he couldn't do anything about it. Because his law was written down and everyone had to obey it. And these guys then persuaded the king to say, well, get rid of Vashti, get rid of the queen, it's going to be good for us all. And after the battle, he's a bit sad and he wants some comfort, but he can't change the law. He's stuck. And so then the next issue comes in and they say, well, you can't get this wife back, she's a bad one, she's out of the way. And of course, she would be locked up somewhere, she could never get out, she would always be in prison because she'd probably be the king's wife. But now, well, what are we going to do with this? The best, thing, the best way to solve this issue is for the king to find another wife. And this king, he had lots and lots of wealth and palaces. and He could have access to anyone he wanted. And the women, the young women, they were thinking, well, it would be nice to be the queen. So he said that his servant said to him, well, what you do is collect a whole stack of young, pretty women and they'll come and spend the night with you. And if you like them, they become the queen. If you don't, well, just send them off to another place and then like that's it for them. So it was a good chance for the young girls thinking we could become the queen, but it wasn't a really good chance because they'd get locked away and that was basically the end of their life. Although, you know, it'd be quite nice they could sit in this room that was all enclosed and have baths and all that kind of stuff and get lots of food, but never ever get out again. And so they said, the king said, this sounds like a good idea. It was good for the king, of course, because he could get on with his life and do what he wanted. And so now here's one of these little circumstances where God is dealing. The king wants a new wife, and then we come to the particular little incident where there's this man, his name's Mordecai. And this is an interesting thing too. He, if you look through all his family tree, it says that one of his ancestors, one of his ancestors was a man called Kish. That's important. Just store that away because it doesn't come out in chapter 2. Kish was the father of the first king of Israel, King Saul. Let's store that away. Note it down and It'll come out later, further down in some, in some chapters further out, why that's significant. But this, this man, he, he had one of his cousins living with him. The cousin was a girl and she was an orphan. And so he was obviously a bit old, you know what happens in families. Some get here married young and some not quite so young. So sometimes there's cousins maybe 10 years or 12 years older than this bunch of cousins. So it was like that. This guy was looking after his cousin. But he, he, he was very fond of her and he treated her like she was his daughter. Bring her up and she was an extremely beautiful young woman. Also from the family of Kish. Because she was his cousin. <clears throat> and he, he said to, to this girl, now what this guy Mordecai, he didn't know about the future. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he believed that it was good at that time to say to this girl, you go and get involved in this, I suppose it was a beauty pageant, you go and get involved in this beauty pageant and see if you can become the queen. Now put that one away too because it's going to come out as well. It's just a matter of storing up all the little bits of information and when you finish the book, you say, man, didn't God really work well? 
But at this stage, it's just put this one away, put this one away, and wait to see what happens. Now, Esther was a Jew. And it's interesting that in all of history, from the time of Abraham, well, maybe from the time of Joseph on, the Jews have always been treated badly. And that's because God, in the very beginning, when sin first entered into the world, God made a promise that through one of Eve's descendants, the Saviour would come. That was the promise. He said to Eve, one of your descendants will bruise the serpent's head. So here's the promise. And Satan is trying to make sure that the promise never happens. You know, he didn't want to get his head bruised. And if he could stop the thing along the way, well, it's free and easy. No more head bruising. It's great men too. And so, as time goes by, things get more and more refined until finally we know that the Jews are going to be the people responsible for this one that's going to bruise Satan's head, called the Messiah, or called the Christ. And so, Satan is trying to destroy the Jews all the time. That's why they're in trouble, because God's made a promise. And that promise has to rely on the Jews for it to be fulfilled. That's why they're in trouble. But Mordecai says to say to Esther, don't tell anyone you're a Jew. In fact, her name was Hadassah. And Hadassah means myrtle. Myrtle is a kind of a flower, it's a tree. So it's a, if you call someone after a plant, usually that's meaning they're a beautiful person because plants and flowers look nice, don't they? So it's an indication in her name of beauty. But she changed her name from Hadassah. I, I expect Mordecai probably told her to do this. She changed her name to Esther, which is a Persian name. And Esther means star. So there's also this idea of the beauty. You know, if you get up in the morning sometimes, the right time of the year, there's the moon, and just close to the moon, there's this really beautiful bright star called the morning star. But apart from the moon, and when the moon's not there, this one is the brightest thing in the heavens in the morning. And so there's an idea of someone shining out there, showing that God is working. And people's names in the Bible are significant, they have meanings. So here's a person put out there to be a bright light, showing the world how good God really is. You know, the morning star is actually a planet, it's Venus. Sometimes it's the morning star and sometimes it's the evening star. Because it, it wanders around a bit different to all the stars. <clears throat> but it's a thing of beauty. However, Venus doesn't have any light of its own. Venus is reflected light. So here's someone, her name means reflected light. And she comes into the top of the kingdom of Persia. Because as we go through, we see that she actually was chosen to become the queen. And she's, she's reflecting God's light into the kingdom of Persia. And then there's this other little thing. And this last section from verse 19 to verse 23, that's another one. Just put that away. Because it's important as well. But as you're going through it, you know, we live in a, a stage where we all know what our rights are, don't we? And we'll die to defend our rights. And this is one of those things where you think this guy didn't get his rights. He used to wait outside the gate of the palace and he would get messages to find out what was happening. Because he cared about this and he wanted to know how she was going. And while he was waiting to get these messages to find out what's happening, he heard two guys who were fairly close to the king and they were plotting to kill the king and take the kingdom. And so he sent the message to Esther, she told the king, and the king got his detectives to check it out, and it was true. But nothing happened. That's bad. You know, he really deserved to get some kind of reward, didn't he? But this is being saved up. This is a critical event that later on in the book shows how God's working. And in our life, sometimes God doesn't say yes, 
But he also doesn't say no. God says to us, wait. Why does God want us to wait? Because when it happens, it will just be at the perfect time. So here's this guy. He saved the king's life. And the king showed, oh, I think you've got a medal on, you know, it's Order of Australia, Order of Persia, sorry, Order of Persia, or something like that. At least he should have got a few hundred million bucks or something reward. And nothing happened. And that's where we stop today. But there's things there, remember? Someone belonging to Kish. Here's this thing with Mordecai. And there's another thing too that I can't remember this offhand. But stash them away because they all become important. This book shows us how God is working. In fact, this is probably a commentary on a verse from Romans. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to this.